This gospel appears only in the book of Luke. And I want to emphasize the significance of this, not only so that we will get a true image of God, and we will discover and learn something about ourselves. 25 years ago or so, I read a book called The Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nouwen, this Dutch priest. And it so fascinated me, this book, that I read it a second time and I read it a third time. And I used it for prayer and I wrote journals on it. And I wrote all sorts of meditations on it. I used it in conferences for retreats. And it so fascinated me, the book based on a painting by Rembrandt. And by the way, among Flemish artists in the world of art, this painting is unrivaled as a masterpiece. And therefore, I went all the way to St. Petersburg in Russia to see that painting. I went into the Hermitage and I said, I don't want to see anything else. Take me to the Rembrandt section. And when I got to Rembrandt, I spent two days looking at this painting, making notes, and let me tell you what it said to me. So if you haven't read Henry Nouwen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, I want you to think about reading it. I have a notion that maybe every Sunday I should announce a book. So this is the book for this Sunday. It's an easy read, it's in paperback, it's not expensive, and our bookstore does have it. So it's based on this painting. So let me tell you a little bit about the painting because it has an enormously beautiful teaching in it. Here is the return of the prodigal son. And look at the prodigal son. It's a dysfunctional family. It's a broken family. Now, some of us may be familiar with broken families. I am familiar with a broken family. And whenever a family is broken, it's never one person. I know we'll blame that person, we'll blame this person. A broken family can never be attributed to one person. And this is a story about a broken family. And so this younger son takes all his belongings. He's egotistical, he's arrogant, he's selfish, um, he's entitled. And so he takes up all his belongings. He wanders off to a foreign land, a foreign land, a distant land that's important in the parable. It's um, outside his home. He leaves home and then he squanders everything and he is impoverished. He is so impoverished that this Jewish man gets to the bottom. He is sent to take care of the pigs and he yearns to eat the food that belonged to the pigs. That's how low he got. He hit bottom. Then he decided to come back. And I'll tell you about that in the homily. Let me tell you about the painting. You can see this son here. He doesn't have shoes on because he's enslaved. Huh? His shaven head, part of enslavement. And the father welcomes him back. And he said, put shoes on his feet, restore his dignity. Put the finest robe on him. Give him back his sonship. Put a ring on his finger. Give him the visa card. That's the signet ring. <laughs> Not only does he forgive his son, he heals him. He makes him whole. Um, by the way, Rembrandt has the father as an old man and he's blind. So Rembrandt was asked, how is it that if he's blind, he could see him when he was far off and run out to meet him? He said he saw him with his heart. You can see things with your heart that you can't see with your eyes. That's the first teaching. He saw him with his heart. Now, if you look at the father in the painting, rather interestingly, his left hand is masculine and his right hand is feminine. God is not masculine and feminine. God is androgynous. God is spirit. God is love. He embraces his son. There's a, a very dim image in the center at the back. That's presumed to be the prodigal son's mother. But she is not important to the teaching of the moment. It's nothing to do with men and women. It's got to do with the teaching. Um, you can see the servant on the right side. 
of the father, which indicates their well-off family, they have servants. You see the imperious, superior posture of the elder son, whose hands are folded like this in sarcastic judgment. Now watch the teaching of this. It's, it's just extraordinary. And you'll find yourself in here somewhere. Now, that appears on the cover of the book that I spoke about, The Return of the Prodigal Son. So I'll retire the painting for a moment, and we look at the teaching of the parable. And here are some teachings from the parable. The younger son is selfish. Where do we find ourselves in this parable? Whenever we were selfish and we broke away from home, we caused trouble, we caused disruption, we had to get our own way, we had to demand what was coming to us, and we left home, going off to seek our fortune, and he dissipated his money on dissolute living. He had friends as long as he had money, but when the money disappeared, the friends were gone. And now he is in poverty, and he's homeless, so he decides he's going to come back to his father, but he rehearses his confession. Something, I don't know if you've ever had to rehearse a confession. I have had to rehearse a confession more than once, especially when I was a teenager. I put the last thing first, the first thing last, hope he wouldn't know who I was. But he always said, did you sin last week? I said, I did. oh, you're not trying hard enough. So he rehearses his confession. And he decides, I'll say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. He's not sorry. He doesn't know where to go. There's no, no indication of sorrow. <laughs> You know, the kid that comes home and you think he loves you, but he's got the laundry, you know? Do you? So he, he, he just has no place else to go. So he rehearses his confession. But his father couldn't treat him like a servant, because if he did, he would deny his fatherhood. And the father did not want to deny his fatherhood, so he had to accept him as his son. He runs out to meet him. Notice the dynamic. He goes out to meet the sun. The image of God, he goes out to meet the sun. He embraces him, welcomes him, not only forgives him, but he heals him. Let us celebrate this crazy son of mine was dead and he has come back to life. The beginning of reconciling a family. And now we have the elder son. He's the one that comes to the 9.30 Mass every Sunday. He uses the envelopes. He keeps all the rules. Uh, he's very obedient. He's very legalistic. And he's very judgmental. He's angry. He's carrying a bitterness inside of him. I know he prays and he keeps all the law. But inside he's corrupt. Corrupted by jealousy. By carrying anger corrupted by presuming to make judgments because he hasn't faced his own sin. So he won't go into the celebration, but his father comes out to meet him. But he says to his father, for years I have served you well. I merited something. I deserve something, and you didn't give it to me, and I am angry, and I'm jealous. And the father said, but my son, you have always been with me, and everything I have is yours. This is a much more difficult conversion, because he does not see his sin. Until you see your sin, until you ex accept your sin, and until you want to ask for forgiveness, there is no reconciliation. So wherever the broken family, trying to put it back together, 
We're all sinners in this family. But he's not a sinner. Therefore, see him in the painting. He's not reconciled. He's not part of the family. He's still standing in judgment. The father is interesting to me. I have met the father in prayer, and I've met the father in my life. I think the father was a bad father at the beginning. Because both sons were alienated from him. Was he too strict? Was he too severe as a father? Was he too demanding? Were his expectations too high? So that both sons are separated from him. What is there about this father? Did he experience some incredible sense of poverty in the broken family which he had, which caused him to go through a conversion. He goes through a conversion. He becomes a loving father, a forgiving father. He becomes an understanding father. He becomes the image of God. He makes the first move in reconciliation. Is he a father? Is he a mother? He's a parent. And his rigidity, I look at myself in my life as a priest, as a pastor. There was a time when I was legalistic, when I made judgments about people, when I was highly canonical. Before communion we say, we all say, Lord, I am not worthy. And then we come to communion even though we're not worthy. But then we tell other people, you can't go to communion because you're not worthy. But I just said, I'm not worthy. Think about that. Is there somebody in our family that is so perfect and so superior that they can make judgments and separate people and alienate people and overlook the weakness of people? That's the father. But he goes through this conversion and he becomes a consummate, loving, forgiving father, but he goes through a conversion. He goes through an enormous conversion in his life. He is the father, he is the mother. He is the one who is the image of the infinite, unconditional embrace of God's love. He is the one who goes out to meet us where we are, not to meet us in our mystical perfection, not to meet us because we merited this. People say to me, I am so blessed in life, but I don't deserve it. I'm, of course you don't deserve it. Where did you get the impression you deserve it? You don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's free. It's a blessing. It comes from a place of consummate and infinite generosity. Marvelous. So are you the selfish one? The one has to have the last word. The one who will break a family because you're too judgmental or your expectations are too high. Are you the elder one? Where well, you give yourself a dispensation to make judgments about other people. Where well, you can see the sins of others but not see your own sin. Are you the elder? Are you the father, the mother? whose expectations are so high, you can't stand disappointment in your children. Are you this demanding parent that needs to go through a conversion to see your own sins? And somehow in the power of the Holy Spirit to be more like the God whom we profess to follow. So, the conversion and the reconciliation happens in this family, in the parable, but not entirely, because the elder son has a far more difficult time going through a conversion because he has not yet seen his sin. So in the Ignatian exercises, the first prayer you've got is prayer 
of tears, a prayer to see your sin, to see your failure. There is no conversion. There is no experience of the living God until I first come to terms with my own poverty, my emptiness, my sinfulness. So, where are you in this marvelous parable from Luke chapter 15? The younger son, the elder son, or the parent? All in need of conversion. And it will happen only when we get a true image of God, the infinite love of God, to bless us in our sinfulness, to lift us up in our weakness, to empower us with a vision of glory through forgiving, through kindness, through generosity, through sharing. Wow! The freedom of living as children of God. Amen.